Hello, I'm Emma Desi and welcome to another episode of Turning Readers Into Writers. If you're brand new here, welcome and here's what you need to know. This is a community that believes you are never too old to write your first novel. No matter what you've been up to until now, if you're ready to write your book, I'm ready to help you reach the end. I focus on helping you find the time and confidence to begin your writing journey, as well as the craft and skills you need to finish the book. Each week I interview debut authors, editors and industry experts to keep you motivated, inspired and educated on all things writing, editing and publishing. If you want to catch up, head on over to emmadesi.com where you'll find a wealth of information and tools to help you get started. Before we dive in, this week's episode is brought to you by my free cheat sheet, 30 Top Tips to Find Time to Write. In this guide, I give you 30 ways that you can find time to write in the small gaps that appear between the various errands and tasks and responsibilities that you have in your day-to-day -day life. Now, you might be thinking that you don't have any time to spare, but I can guarantee these top tips will give you writing time you didn't think you had. If you thought writing always involved a pen and paper or a keyboard, think again. If you thought you needed at least an hour at a time to write your manuscript, I help you reframe that. You won't be disappointed. Get your free copy of 30 top tips to find time to write by going to emmadesi.com forward slash 30 top tips. Okay, let's dive in to today's episode. Helen Starbuck no relation to the coffee bunch, is a Colorado native, former perioperative or OR nurse, and the award-winning author of the Annie Collins mystery series and standalone romantic suspense novels Legacy of Secrets, Finding Alex and The Woman He Used to Know. She loves mysteries, suspense, romance and any book that is well written. Helen is a huge fan of books with independent, strong women characters and, as Neil Gaiman says, stories where women save themselves. So let's delve into our conversation with Helen, find out how she came to be writing, how she came to be a, an award winner and what she's working on now. Well, hi, Helen. It is so lovely to have you here. Thank you very much for joining me. Well, thank you for the invitation. Oh, it's a pleasure. And um, now I always start off my um, episodes just by asking my guests, tell us about your journey to writing and, you know, where you are now. My writing began as a younger woman. Uh, well, I guess you would say a younger girl uh, when I was in my early teens. And it was mostly for my own entertainment. Um, I often uh, complained about boys that I was infatuated with, that kind of thing. Uh, and it progressed. I wrote, gosh, all the way through my 30s or so. Um, it got a little, well, I actually submitted a, a manuscript to Harlequin Romance, and they, they sent it back and said they really enjoyed the story, but that it was more mystery than it was romance. And so it really didn't fit with, and so that was kind of my clue that maybe mystery suspense was more my genre. Um, and then I married and uh, had a daughter and uh, the writing kind of went by the wayside as I'm sure a lot of women discover. And uh, then gosh, number of years later, uh, my husband and I divorced. And then I had the, the job of being a single mom until my daughter uh, graduated and left home. And at that point, um, I was uh, working as a clinical editor for a nursing journal. I am a nurse. And uh, I did regular editing of articles that were accepted. And I also, uh, was given the task of developmental editing for nurses whose articles had been turned down by our editorial board, but they thought the topic was interesting. And so I worked with them to, to get the articles into a shape that 
the art that they would be accepted and published and had quite a bit of success with that. And, uh, and then I got to the point where I retired and I finally had time to do my own writing. And I moved and just in the process discovered a uh, four chapters of a story that I had begun years ago and really still liked where I was going with it. So I thought, well, all right, I'm just gonna see where this goes. And I wrote my first book and I found an editor who specialized in mysteries and, and suspense. And we worked together well, probably six, seven months. Um, I really liked her. She had a great sense of humor and she was very uh, helpful, very direct. Uh, she would say, I really like this part, but you've kind of gotten off in the woods here. So we kind of need to bring it back. Um, and, and that was the first book that I published and uh, it won a National Indie Excellence Award for the mystery category. And it got a 10 out of 10 rating from the Book Life Prize Contest, which then put me into the quarterfinals. Now, it didn't go farther than that, but I felt like it was such an honor um, to get that far. So that was my baby. <laughs> and it, at the moment, is a three book series. Um, there may be a fourth book that's been kind of a struggle. I joke that my main characters, I put them through so much, they're not talking to me anymore. So, <laughs> so that's kind of my writing journey. And um, it's sort of been the fulfillment of something that I've wanted for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, congratulations on the awards and Thank getting you. that, that um that such positive feedback from people in the industry. That's amazing. Well done. Thank yeah. you. Um, I was curious, you know, the editing that you were doing um, when you were for the nursing journals, even though it was nonfiction, did you find that that experience actually helped you to when it came to writing your fiction? It did uh, very much. Uh, one of the issues that I often dealt with was, well, what I would call in fiction plot holes. In, in nonfiction, it was kind of a they had started in one place and then jumped to another place and the reader had to find a way to get there and as I used to tell them you have to assume when you're writing for this audience that they have never done what you're doing so you have to be clear about how you get from point a to point c you can't leave out b um, and it was just a matter mostly of, uh, they had a great idea and they weren't terrible writers. They just had never done it. Nurses are not really until maybe the last 10 years or so have never really been expected to publish unlike doctors and university folks. And as the nursing profession has evolved uh, more and more hospitals, for you to move up the clinical ladder are expecting you to publish. And so um, it, was, it was a lot of fun. I, uh, I got a lot of uh, wonderful thank yous from nurses that I helped who then went on to, to publish more. So it was very gratifying for me knowing that I had helped these uh, people do a you know, completed dream of theirs. Mm -hmm. And so, Translating that to fiction, um, I have a very good idea, especially with other people's work, of seeing where there are holes. Um, now, I will say this, and I think it's important for anyone who is writing. Um, we are way too close to what we write to sometimes see that. And so I believe no matter what you write, you really need an editor, someone with a totally unconnected to you point of view, who's who will spot those things that you have in your mind, you have 
completed, but you haven't really completed them in the story. Yes, I absolutely agree. It's so, uh, as you say, it's so much easier to spot things in somebody else's work because you have that much more objective view and you're coming to it fresh. Whereas when you've been thinking about something in your own head for months, maybe years, you know it so, so well that you think you've put it down on the page and it's quite a shock when a reader reads it <laughs> and you, realize, well, you discover you haven't. <laughs> exactly. And um, I mean, the same goes for proofing. Our brains fill in the blanks and we oftentimes don't see uh, missing words or misspelled words. And so, again, I think it's important to have a, a proofer who's never seen the manuscript before and they often spot things and you think, boy, why didn't I see that? Yeah. yeah. Well, I'd love to go back to your, your fiction itself and your process of, of writing. And I wonder for you, what do you find the most difficult aspects of, of writing a first draft perhaps, or perhaps it's, it, it's the revision that you find difficult? What for you is the most sort of difficult aspect of writing? I think the most difficult aspect is the first draft. Um, and particularly the middle of the story. Um, when I was working on the journal, it was very easy to outline because the nursing process, talking about anything has a specific flow. So um, that was not a problem. When I write fiction, I, I have a terrible time outlining. So. The first draft is often the most difficult because I have an idea where the story is going. I'm never quite sure how I'm going to get there. And sometimes things change in ways that I didn't really anticipate. The story takes a little different path or a character changes uh, significantly from what I thought they were going to be. So that first draft is, uh, probably the most difficult. Revisions for me are actually kind of fun. Um, I enjoy the feedback that I get from beta readers, uh, the readers that I send the manuscript to for feedback before it goes to the editor. Um, and I also enjoy getting the feedback from the editor so I can then see the issue and go back and fix it. And going back and fixing it is usually nowhere near as difficult as writing it in the first place. <laughs> yeah, I think that is um, a sort of common thing to most sort of pantsers or gardeners, is the other common phrase used. When we start off with an idea and we just want to see where it goes, it's like, for I think for us, it's the most fun part of the writing is that going on the journey with the characters and seeing what happens. But then... As you say, we can end up going down tangents where characters can take a turn we didn't expect. And so I've certainly found that in revision, I enjoy doing revision, but it's um, it, it's almost where the real hard work starts because now I've got to try and pull it all together and make it cohesive. I don't know if that if, if you share that experience or um, are you are you more aware of pulling things back together as you're writing the first draft? Um. It's often not clear to me on the first draft. I, um, there were several instances uh, where feedback from my editor and a beta reader totally shifted the beginning and the end of a book. Um, my editor came back on the third book in my series and said, I kept wondering when the story was going to start. And she said, the story starts here. And, and here was about the third chapter. <laughs> so I had to get rid of the first two chapters. And some of it I was able to sort of integrate later in the story. And I think her, her call on that was 100% right. It kind of threw me for a minute. It was like, wait a minute, you know? Um, and then the feedback I got from... Uh, uh, a friend that I always have read my manuscript. She reads voraciously in the mystery suspense genre. And she's always been very good about not just telling me, oh, I love it. You did such a good job, which you have to be wary of when you use 
friends or family members because often they're afraid to hurt your feelings. Um, and and her phone call was was very a very cute example of this. Her first comment to me was, "How much does our friendship depend on what I tell you?" <laughs> and I said, "It doesn't at all. That's why I said this." She goes, "I hate the ending." I hate it so much that if you weren't a friend, I'd probably never buy any more of your books. And I was like, good grief. It was like, okay, what's wrong with it? And again, she was absolutely right. And when I mentioned it to my editor, she said, keep her around because I really didn't like the ending either. And it was like, (laughs) okay, then. And, and, you know, I think because of those two people, that was the book in my series that Kirkus gave a starred review to and they only do that with about two percent of indie authors so it was like you guys are gold (laughs) so again I um the revisions can be hard that was that was a hard one because I had to uh you know get rid of mm, several chapters in the beginning and then I had to think of a whole new ending Mm -hmm. and So that took a while, but I'm glad I did. Yeah, I mean, you can see there, that's a great example of just how important those revisions are. It's not just about the the first draft. You know, I often say to my students that the dirty first draft is where you get the idea down and you get the basic structure of your story down, but it's in the revisions that you work the magic. That's where the magic happens. And I think that's a a beautiful example there. Absolutely. Um, So I was curious, because you write across two genres. You, You mentioned romance and mysteries. Um, or romantic suspense and mysteries uh, what drew you to those two genres and uh, is that what you read in as well or have you found that you've been drawn to that as a, as a writer well I've always enjoyed those two genres those are the the top two types of books I read now I read other things as well um, I enjoy a number of authors who write mysteries. Um, I love uh, Tana French. She's a, an Irish author that writes a Dublin Murder Squad series. She's written a couple standalones and they are excellent as well. She has the most beautiful writing style. Um, and I like Craig Johnson and I like Michael Connolly. Uh, so there's this whole group of authors that I really enjoy reading and because of the mystery and because of the structures of the books and and their characters are wonderful. And for romantic suspense, I have a couple authors who I really like. Um, I like Tammy Hogue. She's, she kind of straddles the line between mystery and crime and romantic suspense because there's always a strong male female relationship in the book which is how I view romantic suspense Um, but there's also a murder mystery uh, some sort of a police mystery and again I'm very drawn to strong characters they're what hook me and I love her she's got a couple books Um, one is a detective series and the two main characters are a male and female uh, homicide detectives. And I just love them. The other couple, again, are two a male and female police officers in a small town. Um, and then Romantic Suspense, another author that I enjoy um, is Sandra Brown. She has never written a series. She writes standalone books, um, but the, the writing is Tight. The stories are suspenseful and intriguing. And then the relationship between the, the male and female characters often starts in a bit of an adversarial position and then gradually moves into a more romantic connection. And I like again her characters i'm very i'm very character influenced if i can't relate to a character i use i will 
often finish the book, but it's there. Those books are never my favorites. Mm -hmm. um, I think you have to create characters that hook the reader and keep them invested in the story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, cool. And I'm curious, a thriller and romantic suspense, um, or rather mysteries and romantic suspense, do you find that there's a, um, there's a commonality between the structure of the stories and the key scenes that you need to include and how you build the tension to get to that big end? Or do you find them actually to be quite different in the way that they are structured? Uh, I think they are structured very similarly. And I would say that the difference with a mystery, um, as opposed to romantic suspense, a mystery doesn't necessarily end happily for the main characters. Um, it, it can have some romantic connection, but it doesn't have to. And there are a number of mysteries, series and books that, that have, that don't have that at all. Mm -hmm. And, um, the difference between romantic suspense, the plots are very similar. There's a usually a murder, some type of crime. Um, and then the two main characters work to solve it or in the suspense to stay safe until they can figure out what's going on. So I think the biggest difference is that interpersonal relationship between the two main characters and then the endings in romantic suspense often are either what they call HEA happily ever after or H for now so it's happily for now so it ends on the point that it's it's I guess optimistic you either have the sense that these two people are going to continue their relationship or their relationship has um, come together and you, you know, you have this sense that everything is going to be wonderful. <laughs> um, so those are the differences as I see it. Um, mm -hmm. and I can, I can see from the way you're talking that, um, you know, you enjoy, uh, both, um, both of the genres and they give you, you something different. So you write in series, how do you determine, uh, what you're going to write next or which series or which genre you're going to write in next? Um, what prompted me to turn my first book into a series, um, it ended on a, a note of, I don't, for the reader, of hoping that things end well, but not really being sure that they were going to. And the two main characters in the book um, start out as they, they share a duplex. And they are friends and they've been friends for a while. And you see the friendship deepen through the first book, but it ends and you know that the guy has deep feelings for the, the woman and it's told in first person from the woman's point of view. But the relationship is still, at least from her point of view, friendship, very good friendship. But I, so I finished the book and it was kind of like, I like these two and I like other characters in the book so much that I wanted to see where it went. Mm -hmm. um, and with it ending the way it did, there was the potential for at least another book. And, and so over time, that relationship becomes much closer. Um, and then what got me started on the romantic suspense was the fact that book four in the series was just absolutely stalled. Um, I had come up with three or four different plots and in talking with my editor, she was kind of like, yeah, I just, I'm not feeling it, you know? And it was, so it was like, okay, well, I'm going to just let this rest. Uh, if I never write a fourth book, it's okay the way it ends. Um, I'd like to write more, but right now it's just not coming. And for me personally, I can't force that. Mm -hmm. So I attended a writing seminar um, and the 
person leading it passed out a whole bunch of iconic photographs. Uh, well, they weren't photographs, they were reproductions of paintings or whatever, things like uh, Edward Hopper's, that picture of the man sitting in the diner and it's dark, and a couple, Andrew Wyeth and some other ones. Anyway, I found one that her, her instruction were find, a, find one that speaks to you, and then I'm going to give you 15 minutes and you go write something about it. And the picture that appealed to me was this old farmhouse sitting in the middle of a field of overgrown grass and the farmhouse looked neglected. And that was the impetus for my first standalone, which is Legacy of Secrets. And the story that evolved was a father's suicide and a daughter who discovers well, she can't believe it's he committed suicide, but all, everything says he did. And in sorting through his belongings, she discovers that there was a whole side to her father she never knew. And so she goes to the small town on the, the eastern plains of Colorado, where he grew up, and the family home, the, the old farmhouse sitting in a field of overgrown grass, he has he still owns and it now belongs to her and it is just falling apart. And so that is the journey for her is finding out why did he keep it? Why did he let it fall apart? What was there in his life growing up that may have contributed to his suicide? And she's helped by his next door neighbor, a younger man who became friends with her father that again, she knew nothing about. And so it's a journey of discovery and it's a journey that discovers that in fact, he did not commit suicide. So, so that filled time where I couldn't move on the series, these stories kept coming to me and that's, that produced the three standalone novels. Um, so I, I think you have to be open to those ideas that pop into your head, those characters or those stories. Uh, and I think that helps with writer's block. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think it can be really, really helpful. I think it's what Joanna Penn would describe as a palate cleanser. You know, you get the opportunity just to go away from the one that you're struggling with and do something that might just be for fun. It might not come to anything, but exactly. it's a way of just releasing that uh, creative energy again and relaxing and enjoying it again. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, uh, you know, I think with writing, if it doesn't entertain you or help you enjoy life in some way, if it doesn't provide some positive effect, then I, I often wonder why you're writing. Mm -hmm. I think it has to be your joy or your uh, bliss, as Joseph Campbell called it, or it's just a slog. I, I don't know, and I, I don't want a slog, so... <laughs> Um, now you mentioned Colorado there, and I um, I think a, a lot of your novels are are set in Colorado. What is it about that state that uh, draws you to it? Well, I'm a Colorado native, so um, I grew up in a suburb of uh, Denver, and I know have lived several places in Colorado. Lived in Evergreen, which is in the foothills uh, outside of Denver and have lived in various areas in and around Denver. Um, my only uh, slight deviation is Legacy of Secrets, which as I mentioned is on the Eastern Plains. I've never lived there, but uh, having grown up in Colorado, I'm familiar with the area. And I, the town is completely made up, but it's made up of towns that I'm familiar with in both Colorado and Montana. Um, so for me, it's, it's very hard to write about a place that I don't know um, or know only as a visitor. And I think 
for real authenticity, you have to be intimately familiar with the place. I think of Michael Connolly, he, he's an LA native, uh, as I understand it. And he writes, he clearly knows LA inside and out. And, you know, there are other authors that I like who, uh, one lives in uh, Minneapolis or Minnesota, somewhere there. And that area, again, is beautifully described. And so I think, uh, I don't know that it's absolutely necessary, but for me, I feel like I have to really know a place. Mm -hmm. And so that's why they're all set in Colorado. <laughs> well, but I've never been, but I believe it's a beautiful state. So why not? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, uh, so I'd like to just kind of um, move us on a little bit from the writing phase of, of a book's life to the publishing um, side of it. And you, you've opted to go to be an independent author, yay, um, yes. rather than the traditional. What prompted you to make that decision? Well, it was a very personal one. Um, my father passed away at 71. My mother almost made it to 95. So for me, it's like a roll of the dice, you know, where, where is my time going to hit? And my editor said, well, you know, you can go two ways. You can go traditional, but to do traditional publishing now, first you have to find an agent and that can take a while. You have to find an agent that really loves what you've written and is willing to go out and try to sell it to a publisher. And she said, so that whole process can sometimes take three or four years or longer, uh, depending on what you write um, and how open publishers are to taking a risk on a first time author. She said, or you can do indie publishing. Mm -hmm. And she said, <laughs> she sent me a five page in email on all the things that I would have to do to publish the book on my own. And after about the first three or four paragraphs, I had no idea what she was talking about or how to do it. So I was kind of like, well, okay. Um, and I thought about traditional publishing and, and some of the things she mentioned that it was good to have, you know, were headshots and a few other things. And I thought, well, okay, I can do these easy things first while I try to decide what I'm gonna do. And it's like fate. Um, I went to a photographer uh, for the headshots and she called me a, a few weeks later and said, um, I wanted to know how your session went. This was the owner of the place. And I, we talked about that for a few minutes. And then she said, well, I understand you've written a book. She said, when is it going to be published? And I laughed and said, well, probably never because I, I can't quite figure out how to do this. And she said, oh, you have to speak to uh, this person she knows. And she said she, she helps indie authors uh, get published. And so I thought, well, I'll give it a try. Um, and the woman I worked with, uh, worked with a company called My Word Publishing here in Denver. And the nice thing is that they, you maintain your copyright, you, you don't hand it over to them. And they have like a cafeteria selection of services. So you don't have to use them exclusively. You can pick and choose what you need. And so that's how I, I published my first book. And I had such a wonderful experience with them that I've let them help me with, get the rest of them published. And what they did for me was take care of all the minutia, like getting ISBN numbers and uh, copyright, you know, pages taken care of and mm -hmm. all that, all that stuff that you can learn how to do, but I was happier letting someone who knew that they were doing do it. <laughs> and then, you know, they, they put everything up on Amazon. They find, they have people who will take your paperback book and uh, translate it into an ebook. And I just, I, I find it so helpful and it takes that 
those tasks and that worry off my plate. Yeah. Um, so that's how I in, indie published. Well, it sounds like a great, it sounds like you're sort of doing the hybrid option where you're using a professional organization to kind of navigate those more tricky elements. And let's be honest, the more boring elements, nobody wants to spend time <laughs> working on copyright pages. So it feels <laughs> like a, a good solution all around. Um, but I'd love it if you could tell us a little bit about your uh, most recent release, The Woman He Used to Know, and then to tell us what you're currently working on. Um, the book that just released, it came out uh, January, is a not really a police procedural, but it's the main character is a homicide detective. And I like, I was intrigued by the idea of what would a homicide detective do if he arrived on the scene of a crime and discovered that he knew both the victim and the wife and that he had been in love with the wife and they had had, they had never had really a relationship, anything other than a friendship. And then five years earlier, they had reached a point where it all just broke apart and they hadn't had any contact. And he had always disliked the man she married. They, the three of them had been friends for a very long time. Um, he didn't consider him really a friend with the husband, but knew him very well. So then the question is, his partner is not available the night he gets called in. And all the signs point to the wife as being the one who killed the husband, despite the fact that she swears she didn't. And so the dilemma for him is, how long do I stay on this before I call in another detective and take myself off of this because of the conflict of interest? Mm -hmm. And he is worried that she might very well have killed her husband. And so, and he has a reason for wanting to be involved because there are reasons that he doesn't want anyone else to find out about among them, the relationship he had with the couple. And so it starts out with that conflict. And I have a little uh, advertising blurb that says, um, is she guilty? Does he care? And the it's an old flame a dead husband and a compromised cop what could go wrong <laughs> so it's kind of the study of what went wrong yeah oh great um, taglines I love it thank um, you you mentioned there that this is a procedural um is this the first procedural that you've written and did that involve kind of a new set of research to do it did um and yes um my previous book had police involvement as well. Um, and that intrigues me. And I've gone two years in a row to a conference called the Writers Police Academy. And um, it, it's a three or four day conference where experts in uh, policing and forensics and forensic psychology come and talk to writers who write mystery or suspense or police procedurals. And it is absolutely fascinating. I have had more fun and learned more about the homicide detectives, the FBI, uh, forensic specialists, and I, I belong to Sisters in Crime, and they have wonderful speakers in, in our Colorado chapter who come in, and there are also access to many uh, uh, podcasts and webinars uh, from the uh, national Sisters in Crime. And I have some contacts here in town that I've had to uh, find and and talk to. And I will say this, um, probably one of the hardest things I ever had to do with the first book, uh, 
was find a homicide detective and ask about if, if this happened, what would you do? And uh, he was a retired homicide detective and, and very nice, very patient and, uh, and also very, what I call linear. They are, if this happens, this has to happen, this has to happen, this has to happen. And I remember uh, in one of my series books, I said to him, well, okay, so I want a felon uh, to be injured in the prison badly enough that he had to be taken to a hospital. And I want him to be able to escape. So what would be the setup to guard this guy while he was in prison? And he said, well, there'd be a cop in the room and there'd be a cop outside the door. And I said, well, I'm trying to make it easy for him. He goes, no, there'd be a cop in the room. There'd be a cop outside the door. I said, well, what about, no, there'd be a cop in the room. There'd be a cop outside the door. So I finally thought, well, okay, fine. There's a cop in the room. There's a cop outside the door. Now I've got to figure out how to get this guy out of the hospital. Um, but I do think that keeps you honest. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I you to be more creative, I would imagine, as well. It does. <laughs> it does. And, uh, you know, I've, I've taken uh, classes in this Whitehurst Police Academy on all sorts of bizarre things like blood spatter and <laughs> um, bug, how does bug infestation affect mm -hmm. corpses and time of death? And I mean, it's just... It's fascinating. It so. is fascinating. We've got a TV series here called Expert Witness, and it's a very kind of light show, but they do talk to witnesses, expert witnesses from real crimes. And a lot of it is always amazing how much pollen is involved and how much insect larvae is involved, and how they can determine exactly where and at what time somebody died or was moved to a I know. It's fascinating. I know. It's, I, and I, with through um, Sisters in Crime, we had a in Denver, there are uh, so many accidental, unattended, and homicide deaths that happen that the medical examiner can't go to every scene. So they employ death investigators. And these are usually masters prepared uh, forensic uh, investigators who they go to a crime scene and they take a look at it and they estimate time of death and they determine whether it is a, you know, just accident related, that's pretty easy. And, or whether an unattended death looks suspicious or whether something's clearly a homicide. And, and no one is allowed to touch the scene or the body and that includes detectives until the death investigator is finished. Um, so a death investigator came and talked to our sisters in crime and her topic was, um, burned, drowned, and eaten. <laughs> and <laughs> she talked about how corpses look and what to look for. And she did caution. She said, now I have brought photos. So if you're at all squeamish, you I want to take this opportunity to leave. <laughs> and of course, nobody left. So um, yeah, it's, it's just fascinating. Um, yeah, yeah. If I was much younger, I might go through uh, the program to become one just just out of curiosity if nothing else. <laughs> and so what are you currently working on? Is it another uh, mystery or are you going have you going back to your suspense? Um, well I'm I've got two projects. I, I think I finally found book number four. Um, so I'm kind of working on that sporadically. Uh, it's still taking its time to evolve. And in the meantime, I'm, I'm working on another um, romantic suspense, suspense uh, story. So I've kind of got two projects going and when one kind of stalls and I go back to the other and think, try and find a way to move it along. And then when that stalls, I go back to the other project. So <laughs> that's sort of what I'm, I'm in the process of at the moment. Oh, fantastic. It's a nice, a nice system to have there. Keeps you going and not getting stalled, as you say. 
Well, Helen, I've loved chatting with you. I particularly have found the last little segment about, um, you know, research for crime useful. I'm really glad I asked that question. Um, uh, but where can listeners find out more about you and your books? Well, they can always go to my website, which is helenstarbuckoneword.com. Um, and my last name is spelled like the coffee bunch. Just know it's just not plural. And there they can uh, see my books. There are links to Amazon. And uh, they can also sign up for my newsletter, which um, will give whoever signs up the first opportunity to hear about things or see book covers or whatever the latest development is. And they can also go uh, to my Amazon page, which is where all my books are listed for sale. And all of my books are paperback, ebook, and audiobook. Uh, the, the new book is in process of getting an audiobook, but right now it's just paperback and ebook. So um, those are places. Um, I'm also on Facebook, again, Helen Starbuck dash author, and I'm on Instagram uh, at Helen Starbuck. So you can connect with me there. Yay, wonderful. Well, I'll be sure to link to all of those places in the show notes. Helen, thank you so much for your time. I've really enjoyed our conversation. I have too. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you found that helpful and inspirational. Now, don't forget to come on over to Facebook and join my group, Turning Readers Into Writers. It is especially for you if you are a beginner writer who is looking to write their first novel. If you join the group, you will also find a free cheat sheet there called Three Secret Hacks to Write with Consistency. So go to emmadesi.com forward slash turning readers into writers, hit join. Can't wait to see you in there. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>